Hello friends and welcome back. Today I get to show off to you, you know, one of my favorite guitars ever made, the Les Paul Jr. from Gibson. Mahogany body, mahogany neck, rosewood fretboard, one P90 dog-eared pickup, wraparound bridge, one volume, one tone, deluxe tuners with the mini buttons on it, just an absolute joy to play. You get a guitar like this, that some people may look at it and, you know, uh, it's a one-trick pony. It's only got one pickup, one volume tone control. There's just not much to it. This is one of those guitars that will deliver everything that you put into it. Your personality is going to come through in a guitar like this. And that leads me to the real reason why I brought this guitar out here today. Um, it's not just to tell you about this wonderful guitar here at More Guitars. It's to talk about the past. In particular, 2020. Eddie Van Halen, Peter Green, Neil Peart, Spencer Davis, John Prine, Jerry Jeff Walker, Mac Davis, Helen Reddy, Alexi Leo, and right before Christmas, Leslie West. He taught me how to play guitar, and he did it on a guitar like this, a Les Paul Jr. One pickup, it was incredible. I've never heard anything like it before or since. In 1971, I was 12 years old, and I heard for the first time the album Mountain Climbing. And I absolutely loved it. I had been up to that point playing Johnny Cash and Venture songs on guitar. That was the realm that my guitar teacher was into. I'd heard Jimi Hendrix. I had heard Eric Clapton. Um, I thought they were phenomenal, but Jimi Hendrix, it was, it was beyond me. I mean, the things he was playing were so complex, I couldn't even grasp them. Um, but then I heard Mountain. And this monstrous guitar tone, beautiful melodies, this vibrato that sung like a violin. And they were simple enough melodies that I could grasp them. I found here in Evansville, Indiana, the sheet music, believe it or not, at a music store to For Yasger's Farm, which was one of my favorite songs on that album. And it even had the uh, guitar solo notated out, note for note, and that's what I was playing in the intro. Um, I never played that song in a cover band, never played it even for fun in a group, but I've never forgot that solo. And learning it, trying to pick up the, the melody notes. <laughs> And I would play the notes. They didn't sound anything like Leslie. So over a span of about three years, I learned how to bend notes. I learned how to do a vibrato, never anything like him. And in that one guitar solo, it will teach you a beautiful vibrato. It will teach you how to bend into a vibrato. It teaches you full step bends and half step bends and quarter step bends. <laughs> Thank you. 
Leslie knew early on that he was not going to be the flashiest guitarist, um, as he put it. He was never going to be the best guitarist on the stage. He was never going to be the best looking guitarist on the stage. But he wanted to have the best tone of any guitarist on the stage. He would work on his tone rather than his licks. One note. How could he make that note sound? What could he do with one note? He never really even took himself seriously as a player. And you've got uh, the people who claim him as influence, I, I'm going to even look at my list here because some of these names are incredible. The people who considered Leslie West one of the best guitarists in history. Randy Rhodes, Eddie Van Halen, Richie Sambora, Joe Satriani, Warren Haynes, Joe Bonamassa, Michael Shanker, Billy Corgan, just to name a few. When Leslie was recording that first album, they had just recorded Never In My Life. And if you haven't ever heard that song. He had just recorded that song at the record plant in New York. Right next door, Jimi Hendrix was working on mixing Band of Gypsies. And Felix Papillardi, the bass player for Mountain and the producer, said to Leslie, why don't you go next door and see if you can get Jimmy to come over and listen to this song and see what he thinks of it. And Leslie was like, what are you talking about? You want me to go next door and ask Jimi Hendrix to listen to something that I did? You've got to be out of your mind. Felix finally convinced him to do it. So he goes over next door. Uh, Mr. Hendrix, uh, I'm, I'm Leslie West. I'm recording right next door. And... Uh, I'd really appreciate it if you could come over and take the lead, you know. So he does. Jimmy comes over, listens to the track, listens to the whole thing in silence, and at the end says, man, that is a hell of a guitar riff. And Leslie said that for the next weeks, he was just floating on cloud nine because Jimi Hendrix had said something good about something that he had done. The best part of this story comes from one of the assistant engineers who was working with Hendrix. At the end of that day, while they were listening to playback of the tracks, he said, just out of nowhere, Jimmy just said to the whole room, do you think I'm as good as Leslie West? Yeah. That's what other guitar players thought of him. This was a guy, you know, he didn't play with his teeth. He wasn't flashy. He wasn't fast. He wasn't, you know, you know, tapping on the, you know, the frets like Eddie Van Halen was. He brought the same kind of tonal integrity and musical integrity to early rock music that B.B. King did with the blues. You know, you listen to Johnny Winter, you listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, Albert King, all of these guys who can just, you know, blaze and you know, you ask them who they think, you know, the best blues guy is. Close to the top is going to be B.B. King. Because... If you do that, and you do it perfectly, who can beat that? Leslie could deliver these tones and do it perfectly. He would find the perfect melodies. Uh, he, and he thought simply. This, this kills me, and this came from an interview that Leslie did. Felix taught him the pentatonic scale when they were in the studio for the first time together. Yeah. Leslie was completely self-taught. He would hear things, figure out how to do them. That's how he made it through the vagrants. Uh, he had several great recordings with the band Before Mountain, a Long Island-based band. Uh, did a cover of Otis Redding's Respect that Otis Redding thought was a killer cover version of it. Um, but yeah, 
Felix taught him the pentatonic scale in their first recording sessions. And he took it and immediately knew what to do with it. He was, I think, as close a thing to a guitar prodigy that there was. He, unfortunately, by the second year in Mountain, uh, he and Felix were, were both into heroin quite heavily. Um, it took Leslie about 15 years before he finally got off of it. By the time he did, um, his health was so poor he had developed diabetes, ended up having his leg amputated, um, battled cancer in the 80s as well. And when he did come back, any time you know, that he came back and played again, even with you know, music that he had written or you know, that he had done with bandmates that he would bring out, he, was always, he always relied on the things he did in the first three Mountain albums. It's sad. It's sad that he's gone. It's sad that we're losing so many of the musicians that I and people from my generation grew up with. But Leslie could be forgotten soon if people don't rediscover it. Take a listen to the live side of Flowers of Evil, and you'll see and hear some of the best live guitar improvisation that you've ever heard. Just amazing tones, amazing things that he could do with his guitar. And you may not have known this, um, Mountain performed at Woodstock. They ended up being cut from the original Woodstock movie because of money bickerings between the management and the people producing the movie. Woodstock was Mountain's fourth gig. The fourth gig they ever played was Woodstock. Where were you playing on your fourth gig? Man, what a man, what a talent. All I can say is I wish you were still here. I wish you had a chance to do more. Thank you for showing me how to play guitar. Y'all, rediscover Leslie West. Listen to those early mountain albums and you'll hear something really, really special. Thanks a bunch for watching. I'll see you next time.